Well, good morning and welcome to another service at Grace Community Church. What is it, May 11th? 12th. 12th. Lost a day already. And uh, so for those of you that are here in person, we say welcome. And those that might hear this by way of internet, uh, we say welcome to you as well. And uh, last summer, we actually did a, a series of messages. And, and when we quit, we quit at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. And that, that's where we landed off. So I thought I would just pick up from 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. But, but I got to thinking, you know what? There's so much in here that I need to re-preach this and reteach it. And so we're going to pick up uh, in, in verse 1. And as I was thinking about the pastoral epistles, that would be 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, I thought about, you know, what if we didn't have those three books? What would we, sorry, what would we miss if we didn't have those three books? What doctrines wouldn't we know about? Or what doctrines would be not as strong without those three books? And so when you think about that, first of all, we wouldn't have the phrase faithful saying faithful saying four times in the pastoral epistle we have that phrase faithful saying and then uh, we also have it not only faithful saying but in verse 15 it says this is a, of chapter 1 this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation uh, and, and the idea behind that phrase and worthy of all acceptation is is, is something to be received kindly. It's something to be approved of. It's something that you look and you go, wow, that's a great truth. And two times in the book of 1 Timothy, we have that worthy of all acceptation. And in this case, it says, let me tell you what's worthy to be received with kindness and approbation and approval, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And isn't that interesting? And he says, you know, uh, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So we see here that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Now back in our text, we have it there in, in, in verse uh, 9. He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. And what does that have to do with? Well, that has to, have to do with the idea of godliness. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But godliness has benefit for you now, and it has benefit in the life to come. But we're going to back up here to chapter 4 and verse 1, and we're going to start off, and here we go. It says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly and 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 nowhere else in the whole of the 66 books of our Bibles do we see that phrase speaketh expressly or the spirit speaketh expressly and when I see that it says now the spirit it indicates to me that the Spirit of God the Holy Ghost the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead we believe that, don't we? We believe that there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, when he says he's, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that's just kind of an interesting little deal. We've got some definitions here. It just means in direct terms or plainly. So I think we can have the idea that as the Spirit of God is speaking, he wants us to understand. What he's about to tell us is something easy and plain to understand. And what is it that is going to be easy and plain to understand? That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And when you see that phrase, that in the latter times, that there is a one-time a phrase in all of the scriptures as well. And when you see that latter times, it, it probably is longer than days. It may be years. I kind of got the concept that, that this departing from the faith 
would be over a period of time. And, and we'll get to the idea of last days because Paul uses that in 2 Timothy chapter 3. But we see here that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. And, and, and when I, I, I've just been thinking about this over and over. And, and there's two possibilities and maybe they're both true. But when you, when you, if you are a believer, you've, you've trusted Christ as your personal savior. You believe he died for you, he was buried, he rose again. You know that for a fact. There was, there was a point in your life that that truth came into your heart and into your life. Now, is it possible for someone like that, an individual, to depart from the faith and give heed to seducing, enticing spirits and doctrines of devils? And I'm going to say yes. Uh, for example, look, if you want to, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where we have a man that has a, his mother as his wife. And Paul said, what in the world are you doing? You know, don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Why haven't you mourned? Why haven't you dealt with this? Why haven't you kicked him out of the church? I mean, it's really very strong. So is it possible that that could be a believer? Yes. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, however, it says that if we deny him, he cannot deny himself. If we are unbelieving, yet he abideth faithful. So for one that has truly trusted Christ as Savior, I don't think it's talking about losing salvation. And we as grace believers don't believe that you could lose your salvation. How many of you, since you've trusted Christ, have ever gotten off track? Where the don't have to raise your hand. Where, where, where the heavens seemed as brass. And, and, you, and you just knew that whatever you were thinking or saying or your behaviors, you just knew it didn't line up with the way God wanted you to live and act and believe. You just knew it. But, but what does God do? And I believe this is still in the dispensation of grace. Others might disagree. I think whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And he doesn't, he doesn't punish you in the sense, oh, your sins are going to get you now. But I believe that God wants you to walk in the Spirit. He wants you to exhibit uh, all of the characteristics and traits of the new nature. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, uh, meekness. Against such there is no law. Galatians 5 has the whole list. Now, there's another sense. Uh, I'll give you plan B, maybe. But there may be another sense of some shall depart from the faith. And I, I did a little, a little study on... on uh, uh, and, and my goodness, the internet just sometimes is just great, isn't it? And, and so I, I, I did a little study, and I went to a website called uh, HinduismForToday.com. Uh, and, and this lady, I believe, is probably a Hindu, and what she does is uh, she talks about the eight major religions of the world and their aspect and relationship to vegetarianism, and the meat-eating in all eight of those religions. And most of the Eastern religions, Hinduism and uh, Zoroastrianism and uh, Shintoism and Jainism, if you're into the Eastern religions, Buddhism, especially their gurus, their teachers, uh, are very uh, profound in telling you that it is wrong for you to eat meat, the flesh of animals. Uh, in fact, one of their guys, we're not going to read it, but one of them said that, you know, if you eat meat, when you come back the next time, you'll be eaten by the same uh, animal that you ate. Uh, I mean, he just really, I mean, they are really down on consuming meat. Now, part of that is in a lot of Eastern religion, you have a thing called Eastern mysticism. And it kind of goes like uh, you either, as part of the universe, the universe is God, and you're part of it, or... Or, or everything that there is, God is in it. Pantheism or panentheism. And so uh, the, the treatment of, of animals and humans on the same level is very prevalent. So in that sense, how would they depart from the faith? I mean, we're going to see in context, they're already departed from the faith, right? So then she deals with Islam and Judaism and Christianity. And she makes the argument uh, uh, in regards to Judaism that Jewish scholars believe God intended man to be vegetarian. And she gives, a, she gives a passage here and there. And the interesting one is what she has to say about Christianity. 
and it says this, um, <clears throat> both vegetarians and meat eaters find support in scriptures. And you know what? That's, that, that's kind of true, isn't it? But, but, you know, God said that he made, uh, he made man to have dominion over the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And uh, so does it look like in this passage that, that animals are on the same level as far as God is concerned? They're not. Uh, uh, an animal, as much as we love animals, I love dogs, I tell you what, in a, uh, I, 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 I just love animals. But they do not have a soul. Now what happens is, is we ascribe human emotions to them, and pretty soon they're like our kids. We've done that, haven't we? We've all done that. But honestly, they, they are not. And, and, and just, just think of all of, for example, all of the animals under the law that were slaughtered by way of sacrifice. And it was God ordered. And, and uh, we, won't, we won't have the time, but uh, if, we, uh, if, we, if we, we could take the process starting in Genesis 129 and see what the diet was in, in the garden, and there it was. He says, God said, Behold, in verse 29, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, uh, tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. Uh, to you it shall be for me. So in the garden, Adam and Eve were, uh, uh, were vegetarians. And, and, the tree, and the tree were ripening. And I have an idea that the tree of life in the middle of the garden there, did you know that tree of life is in the new, is in the new heavens and the new earth? And it yields fruit every month. And, it, and, and, and there it says it's for the healing of the nations and so forth. And, and so they, they, were, they were vegetarians. Now, after the fall, uh, it, it changed a little bit. I mean, he, they literally just had to go up and take it. Now, after the fall, part of the curse was that Adam was still a vegetarian, but he had to, he had to plant. He had to work. He became a farmer. From the sweat of thy brow, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna grow crops. You're going to have to work for it now. Then, then the next step is in Genesis chapter 9, where after the flood, God added meat to the diet. Didn't he? Not the blood, but you could have meat. That's, that's new. Now, that's Genesis chapter 9. Then we get into Leviticus chapter 11, and in the giving of the law, there were certain kinds of meat that you could eat. Now, you could not eat, for example, you could not eat the swine, because although the swine divided the hoof, he did not chew the cud. So they could not eat swine. They could not eat pigs. They could not have bacon and ham and pork chop. That was a no-no. And God was really very uh, sure about this. And in Isaiah, he mentions, he mentions it. And he talks about how disobedient the children of Israel were. And it says, they that sanctify themselves, in verse 17, and purify themselves in the garden behind one tree in the midst, eating, eating swine's flesh. And the abomination and the mouth shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. And so it was a big deal to eat, to not eat unclean meats. In the previous chapter, he mentions, mentions it again. It was a big deal. So, but you can see that God has changed. As he's changed his dealings with man, he's changed their diet. And then we have a, a, another big one that happens in Acts chapter 10. You're all familiar with this. And uh, this, is, uh, this involves Peter and Cornelius, and, and uh, he goes to him, and let's see here. Let's go on here to verse 9. On the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened, and certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, saying, Rise, Peter, 
kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. You don't think that when Jesus was here on earth and now that he's ascended and up and Peter is still on the scene, you don't think that he was still abiding by the dietary laws of Moses? Absolutely he was. And it says it was done three times and the vessel was received up again into heaven. And I think what God was doing at this point was he's introducing to uh, the apostle Peter that, you know, things are going to change a little bit. I have something going on. You know, I just saved this other guy, this Saul of Tarsus, in the previous chapter. And I've got a message that's been hidden in my mind in eternity past. And I'm going to begin to reveal that to the apostle Paul, the apostle of grace. And by the way, folks, he is your apostle today. In Romans eleven thirteen, 13, he says, I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. So when we get accused of Paul, 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 we have scriptural and dispensational authority to say that. Now, we don't follow Paul. We follow Christ as Paul followed Christ. You understand that? We did know Christ after the flesh, he says in 2 Corinthians 5, but now henceforth we don't know him that way anymore. You see that? And once you understand that, and Peter just, he just didn't have a clue. I, I, I've never eaten anything unclean. And so uh, when we get into this uh, passage of scripture with Timothy, and, and this is one of the last books that the uh, uh, Apostle Paul wrote, we find out that uh, when we have these, um, uh, as they depart from the faith, they're going to give heed to seducing spirits or enticing spirits and doctrines of devils or doctrines of demons. And how are these going to come about? Well, they're going to be speaking lies in hypocrisy. And, and so if you're a hypocrite, you sometimes have hidden motives or hidden agendas. You're not genuine. You're not real. You might say one thing and do something else. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared, with a hot iron, speaking lies. Huh, I wonder who is the father of lies. Satan himself, isn't he? In John 8, 44, an interesting little passage. We'll just turn there real quick, and we see something interesting. And the Pharisees are just having this discourse with, with our Lord when he was here on earth. And they, and they, and they, just, got done accu they just got done accusing of him of being an illegitimate son. Look at John 8, 41. You do the deeds of your father. Uh, they said, uh, then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and came from God. Neither I came, uh, I of myself, but he sent me. Do you realize what kind of a slap in the face? And he almost didn't even pause with it. It's like he ignored it, but he heard it. And they're accusing him of being an illegitimate. We're not, we're not illegitimate. You're illegitimate. Isn't that something? What an accusation. And here he is, the second person of the Trinity, the God-man, that come into this world by a virgin, and, and, he, and he took it. He took it. Verse 43, why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of, lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So where do you suppose these seducing spirits and doctrines of devils are getting their headquarter charges from? From Satan himself. From that old dragon, the serpent, and Satan. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. It's remind, it reminds me of, of I, I can give you a real good example of that, and probably I could give some in my own life. But I, I always think of our former vice president, uh, Al Gore, who has written a book, The Earth in the Balance. And, and it's all about you and I and our carbon footprint and the world's ending, and you know, it's, it's that whole radical environmentalism. And then he travels around in his jet. 
Now, to me, that's just a great example of hypocrisy. If you're gonna, if you're gonna believe that, I mean, you can believe whatever you want, but to have that and then and then go ahead and, and uh, literally earn millions and millions of dollars. Uh, so you kind of wonder sometimes about the motives of any one of our politicians, for that matter. But the point is, we don't want to be hypocritical. They are. They're going to fool people. And there's two areas that these. Uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils are going to touch on it. And it says you're having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now what is it? What is our conscience? Our conscience is the immediate moral guide that tells us immediately when we do right or wrong. The Bible says in John 1 9 that Jesus came and he lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Romans 2.15 talks about the conscience, the meanwhile excusing or accusing one another. In the scripture, there is a defiled conscience. There's a good conscience. There's a dead conscience. There's a pure conscience. But here, their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Now, if something is seared, if the conscience is seared, and I, I, I use this example, uh, my wife and I, probably once a week, we like a great steak. We're going to have one this afternoon. Ribeye. Got him at, got him at Fairway. They're, they're about this big. And, 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 and the doctor doesn't want to hear this, but the more marbled they are, the better they are. And we can't wait. And so these are about three quarters of an inch. So they're going to go down three and a half minutes on one side, back up uh, two and a half. Now, what, the reason I put them longer on the bottom is because I want that seared. I want it cauterized. Now, why do I want to do that? Because I want to seal the juice is in. Nothing can penetrate that. So if your conscience is seared with a hot iron, guess what? You know, you know your conscience no longer feels right from wrong. That's a terrible place to be. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it shows how that seared conscience affects everybody. If your conscience is seared, then we know that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own self, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, traitors, high-minded. Uh, it's got the whole list of behaviors that happen when the conscience is no longer sensitive. I, I was dealing with a lady a, a couple weeks ago, and I, I told her, now, you know, you've trusted Christ as your Savior, and I want you to understand that as you go about your daily things, uh, there's going to be things that now kind of bother you that didn't bother you maybe before. Maybe there's something in your language, and all of a sudden you're going to get this little twinge. You go, oh, man, I just, I just took the Lord's name in vain. What in the world? That didn't bother me before. But when you become a believer, you get the new nature of God in you. The Holy Spirit comes in and re uh, resides within you, and you have that sensitivity to right and wrong. It's not seared. But I believe it's possible that, that, that a nation become, can become seared, the conscience of the nation, an individual, and then everybody does what's right in their own eyes, and there are no absolutes. There are no absolutes. But here's the two areas that, that, that specifically in this passage is forbidding to marry. And I just thought that was just kind of a, an interesting thing, forbidding to marry. And, and this idea here is that um, uh, a prohibition against or a hindering of marriage or a repelling, a repulsive things. People begin to look at marriage as repulsive, um, dislike, uh, disagreeable. Um, uh, there's going to be an opposition to taking the plunge. And so if you don't take the plunge, what do you do? It's what we used to call 50 years ago. What did we used to do that when you decided to not get married but cohabit? What did we used to call that? Shacking up. Shacking up. That was one thing we called. What else did we call it? Yeah. Common law. Well, yeah, no, that, that, that's true, depending on the state. But we used to call it living in sin. <laughs> I mean, that's what we used to call it, didn't we? We, I mean, we, we can't talk about that much now. Can we sin? For crying out loud, we can't talk about sin. But we see that that's a, just an interesting deal there. There's going to be an opposition um, to marry. And it's interesting, in today's climate, we even kind of have to look at the definition of marriage, don't we? To unite in wedlock or matrimony to join a man and a woman for life. 
and constitute them man and wife according to the laws or customs of a nation. By the laws ordained, clergymen have a right to marry persons with certain limits prescribed. We, oh, we can't, we, I, mean, uh, I mean, culturally, I, I, can't even, I can't even preach this, can I? Isn't it interesting? Almost everything that you're going to hear from this pulpit in this passage is counter to our culture. It really is. But God says, don't worry about it. Just stand for the truth. Forbidding to marry. There's going to be an opposition. There's going to be a, a negative. Rather than congratulations, your husband and wife, that's wonderful. There will be an opposition to that. And I know, uh, I know friends that just, just do it. I, and I, I go to my mind how I know some believers that do this. And I think to myself, well, your conscience must be seared. You've lost the sensitivity to the spirit of God and the word and words of God. Forbidding to marry and, co and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. And I want to be, as a minister of the gospel of Christ, I want to be a good minister. And the Bible says here in about verse 6, that in order to be a good minister of the gospel of Christ, I need to remind you of these things. He says, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Do you notice that any time we approach God, whether it's Philippians 4, 6, and 7, or whether it's pray without ceasing, or do you know that there's always tied to praying supplicating, asking God, that did you notice that thanksgiving is always tied to it, almost without exception? So when we come to God, we come in a thankful heart. And, I, and I'm one of these preachers that just believes that, 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 you know, that, that you can pray for anything or everything. I know some think that we shouldn't pray for everything, but I, I just think you can and when I look at Philippians 4, 6, and 7, I don't, I don't see anything that's excluded from that prayer list. I really don't. And, and for the preacher to pray, that's great. But, you know, I want you to just to think in your own mind this week, every one of you, I want you to just think. Don't raise your hands. How many of you prayed, actually prayed to God this week? I, I mean literally. Maybe you folded your hand. And you bowed your head. Maybe you didn't speak it, but it was it was a silent prayer. But you know, how 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 do we how, how are we doing there? Or do we just do that on Sunday? I, I pray to God that that's not what's going on. That we only, you know, that your only spiritual food is on Sunday morning. I pray that that's not the case. So he says it's supposed to be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified. It is set apart, it is made holy for our use by the word of God and prayer. So why do we, why do we thank God for the food? On Saturday mornings, the wife and I, we have either pancakes or waffles, with, usually with eggs and fruit, and usually with bacon. I don't know, it just goes together. And, and I, really, I really enjoy that morning and that uh, memory that we've created together, that habit that we go through. And that bacon is sitting there, and it's just out of the microwave, and it's just, just hot. It's wafting up into my nostrils. And we sit there, Lord, just thank you for this day, and thank you for your grace, salvation so rich and free. Thank you for this food. Uh, and I sometimes will say this, and Lord, thank you for this bacon. It is so delicious. And I just pray that you would help it to nourish and strengthen our bodies. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I think that's exactly what he's talking about. And so could you go to the Bible and preach vegetarianism? Yes, you could. Could you go to the Bible and preach certain meats? Yes, you could. But can you go to the Bible today and say all things? Yes, you can. So God has simply, uh, uh, he simply adjusted what he, what he has and what we can do and not do in regards to eating the flesh of animals. So I want to be a good minister of Jesus Christ. And it says here, that I'm supposed to put these things in your remembrance. You see that in verse 6? Now, it's interesting, even the word remembrance is different than recollect or reminisce. 
If you reminisce or re recollect, it, it takes a little more energy and thought. But if you're going to remember, it's something that's, that is right there. And God wants us, God wants good ministers of the gospel to remind you that you can eat whatever you want. There's no dietary restrictions. Now, in Romans 14, he deals with those. There are those that have been vegetarians because of health reasons. And God's not prohibiting that. And he says, look, if you want to eat uh, just vegetables, go ahead. You believe that's better for you? Go ahead. If you don't believe that, then eat the meat. But you know what? Neither one of those two sides are supposed to put the other down. And if I'm a, and if I'm a meat eater, I'm not, I'm not supposed to try to make you one. Let every man be fully convinced in his own mind. You see that? There's some liberty in the body of Christ. Now, I'm going to close here in just a second. But refuse profane and old wives' fables. And I have a whole list of old wives' fables. Uh, you can ask me for it. We're not going to take the, kind, the time to take a look at them, but there's a, all kinds of them out there about things that, you know, they're just like they're in the past on. They're like old legends, urban legends. And, uh, and he says there, we're, we're to refuse those and then exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And godliness is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, it means piety or belief in God and reverence for his character and laws. A religious life, now this is in a good sense. Most of the time religion is not in a good sense. A careful observance of the laws of God and performance of religious duties proceeding from love and reverence for the divine character and commands Christian obedience. And today it would be the grace of God, wouldn't it? I mean, because you're not under the law of Moses, so it would be to propagate the grace of God and the good news of the gospel, the grace of God. It would be, it would be, it would be a thing that we would do to share the good news so people could come to faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And he says that it, it, the bodily exercise profiteth little. And, and it has to do there not with the fact that, it's, that it doesn't do you much good, but it's talking about the duration of time. It profiteth little, but godliness is profitable all, uh, unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So living godly today as a believer is a good thing. It's a thing that we need to do as believers. Not has nothing to do with you earning or keeping or maintaining your salvation. It has to do with your daily walk. For this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. So my encouragement to you is, if you're a young person and you have a lady friend, you get married. If you're a young person and you want to go down to McDonald's and have a double hamburger, go have your double hamburger. Enjoy it and thank God for it. Because that is the truth. And that's what we're interested in. We're interested in the truth. And live a godly life. Let the fruit of the Spirit so move you and, let, and, and yield to that indwelling Spirit. And then you'll be full of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, self-control. Against such there is no law. Father, we just thank you again for your scriptures, the word of God, and we pray that, well, that you would help us to understand it and, and uh, perchance either in our congregation or by way of the inter internet, there may be someone that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal savior, that they've never considered heaven, hell, the hereafter. And as to that person or persons that I would just pray, Father, that you would help them to understand that the gospel that saves today is trust in and belief in and acceptance of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as our full payment for sin and nothing more. We thank you for that simple truth. We pray these things again in that name that is above every name, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.